Louise Bedford here, your host of the Talking Trading Podcast. This is how traders excel. I remember my friend Michael Yardney told me once years ago, the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. What he meant is if you become exceptional in one investing arena, it's likely that your skills will generalize to another arena. Get good with the stock market, you're more likely to be a successful property investor. I'm about to drop you right into a conversation that I had with Michael Yardney on his podcast. If you want to be a success as an investor, this is exactly where you need to be. Have a listen to our conversation and put yourself in the picture. I'm going to give you the latest research, the latest methods so that you can improve your psychological fitness so that you can excel no matter what you are investing in. Hi, Louise. Oh, Michael, great to see you. It's been too long for us uh, to, between our podcast and video recordings, even though as good friends we catch up with each other often. But I was really pleased when you gifted me a copy of your new book that I'd like to just uh, get some background uh, uh, about. My new book. book. Investment. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yes, your new book, Investing <laughs> Psychology <laughs> Secrets. Um, I know it takes a lot of work to, to put a book together. We've known each other for a long time. And I know you like to choose a word to focus your year ahead. You plan your year ahead. You're very clear that way. What's the word you chose for this year, Louise? Energy. I feel that everybody needs a theme because it makes you just feel like you're more dramatic and moving into the year with a lot of success-minded thoughts. So for me, looking at my energy, where I'm spending my energy, it is something that even though, you know, even at the start of the year, you think you're going to continue on, we're moving right the way through the year now. But that word has really made a difference to me, looking at where I spend my energy, where I invest my energy, and the areas that I need to back off from, because they are an energy drain. That's interesting. Every year I start off with a to-do list, things I want to start doing, which I haven't done, a to continue list, things I want to keep doing, but also, as you just hinted a moment ago, things you've got to stop doing, because if you keep doing the same as you did last year, you're going to get the same results. So I like that idea. Now, I know you in, uh, invested a bit of your energy into writing a new book. Uh, you've written a number of books already, but you wrote Investing Psychology Secrets. How does this differ from your previous books, Louise? Well, this is primarily about the psychology of investors. So whether you are a trader of the financial markets, whether you're an investor in art, whether you do things to do with the property market, this is to do with the commonalities between effective investing principles and psychological resilience. Uh, I'm, I'm, Louise, I'm often asked, what makes the big difference between the successful investors you see and the average investor? And it's not their knowledge, it's not their contacts. It, Louise, it's not even their income. In my mind, it's actually their psychology, the way they think. So I was really pleased when I heard this was going to be the focus of your book. So psychological fitness, I think, is the key. So being able to be malleable with our views, but also making sure that we're in line with our values and having a robust plan so that whatever industry we decide to invest in, that we are actually following something that we know works. So that fitness, I think, is quite a, a nice metaphor for the way that we need to treat our own investments. So how can investors develop psychological fitness? I mean, we are, whether it's in the share market, which is much more volatile than the property market, but even the current property market. I know you're an investor in both of those, as am I. The property market has the ups and downs, but there's also the media, which keeps scaring us and uh, the bogeyman's around the corner the whole time, uh, t telling us to be wary. 
It is so true. And I think with all humans, it's so easy to slip backward, isn't it? Unless we have Mm. it at our forefront of our minds, unless we look at our environment and we make it success oriented. So what does it take for you to be a success? And Michael, I know you and I have discussed this between ourselves, but the success environment might mean where you can really do deep work. You can focus and you can have some silence to really do some thinking. It could be that you need a mentor, somebody to help guide you, a support mechanism of people around you that are also in the strive and in the hunt. And it might even be that you need that unreasonable friend that you talk about just to niggle and prompt you. But Also, I think it is to do with the resources that we absorb. So it's the books we read, it's the audios and the podcasts that we listen to, and it's the focus that we bring to the fore. Because if we get lazy with this, if we sit back and we think that all of these things will happen to us with that external locus of control, We are in a very shaky predicament. We need to know that we can control our own destiny. It comes from within and we can influence exactly where we are right now and what can happen in the future. Well, there's so, it's so easy to fall into negative sentiment. A couple of things that you suggested, you said you may need a mentor. I think it's impertinent to think you can do better on your own than others who've already moved to the next level. When I learned I can stand on the shoulders of my mentors, uh, look, when I first started off, I had a bigger ego than I've got now and thought, I don't need a mentor. And I guess I was also a little bit stingy, but I know you mentor people in the share market and our team at Metropole help and give advice to people in, in the property market. How can one do it on one's own when there's so many opinions? So I think it's also very important though, Louise, to find out who should be your mentor, because everyone's got an opinion, uh, but they don't always have a right to tell you what to do, do they? It's so true. And when you're looking for a mentor, some of the things that you should be able to apply like a checklist is, are they a success in the field that you want to be involved with? Because if they're not, they're going to be treating you in a way that is not going to bring about the best results for you. And also have a look whether they've mentored people in the past, make sure that they have got that experience and that they have your best interests at heart as well. So you can have mentors via a book, for example, where they don't even know that they're mentoring you, but probably a more direct way is to get somebody to actually shine a light into your blind spots so that you can be aware of the things that you need to improve and somebody has pointed that out to you. Now, I remember reading many years ago the comedian Buddy Hackett, I'm not sure if he's still alive, said, don't take advice on how to be a comedian, how to be an actor from somebody who hasn't walked the last, well, I think he said 10 feet, that's probably three metres. And what he really meant is everyone had great advice for him as a comedian, but they never walked that last little bit to get on stage and stand in front of an audience and feel the knot in your tummy and uh, how good it is when people laughed with him and how bad it felt when they didn't. So it's much the same in property and in share trading and in everything else. Make sure your mentor has actually done it. And I think the other thing to understand is make sure they're playing the same game as you. Because at the moment, there are a lot of people in the property market talking about commercial property or other things, but that may not be your game. Mate. You may not be at that level. I guess it's the much the same with, with the share market and trading, Louise. Yes, absolutely. I think with anything that you apply yourself to, it's so important to know that things seem to be so simple in the beginning and then you realise once you you start to get into it, it's actually more complicated than you first think. There's a Mm. saying in the share market, there are no old, bold traders because once Uh you've hung around the markets for a while, it strips that ego out of you and if you're not prepared to take advice and to really absorb some of the principles of success, then you're not going to be able to go the distance. No. Now, in your book, uh, you actually draw an interesting analogy between tarantulas, self-worth and investing success. Can you share what all this means, how you drew this connection? 
Yes. Look, there's an interesting study. I love my studies, Michael. This is a thing when I've studied university psychology for four years and then I come out and I play with members of my mental program like they're actually my test subjects. So I do enjoy reading studies and working out how to get the best out of my traders. There was a study, and I'm pretty sure we can all connect the dots on this one, where they took people who were arachnophobes. They were terrified of spiders and yep. they put them into a situation where they'd with a certain amount of duress put a spider on the table and they measured how far the spider was from the person and they mm -hmm. also measured the self-worth of that test subject now the people with the highest amount of self-worth measured the spider in their mind as further away than reality suggested so let's think about how we can apply this as investors. If we want to have a realistic view of our threats, of the things that can go wrong, of the specifics that can trip us up, either in the financial markets or the property markets, we need to work as hard on our self-worth, as hard on ourselves as we do our own business plan. So I think it's just fascinating to see that there are so many things that we can control and one of them is our mindset. Things can be going haywire out there. I mean, always there's things going in the environment that you cannot control, but the thing that you can control is how you feel about yourself, how much work you're putting in and the aspects that really encourage that growth mindset. Well, your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your, lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. So the outside world really is a reflection of your inner world. And so therefore your self-worth, your self-talk, you mentioned a moment this is important, but a moment ago you also mentioned the concept of an internal locus of control and an external locus of control. I've just found there's too many people out there blaming others uh, there's always reasons there's excuses there's the government or the education or, or the system um, but those who actually have more self-worth and feel they're in control feel they're the pilot of their life not a passenger they're, they're much more successful yes absolutely it is interesting with people betray themselves by their words they call it hung by the tongue, where if you're always finding your friend is blaming the their spouse, the weather, their dog, then no doubt they're going to actually be blaming you at some stage as well. And for investors, we can't afford to have that mindset. We have to realize that everything that we do is honing our elite athlete, our high performance individual. Everything that you're doing right now is going to make an impact on your future in the next five to 10 years. Okay, so there's all these challenges out there. What do you see as the biggest challenge at the moment in today's financial market? And then maybe you could also then explain how this psychological resilience that you're talking about could help address these challenges, Louise. Yes, there are a lot of challenges at the moment, Michael. It is interesting though that Often when we think these are new challenges, if we look back over time, these challenges have been with us forever. The biggest one that mm. people are facing at the moment is technological fragmentation. So we are thinking because we have got so much information and there are so many sources we could draw from, we are thinking that we can take all of that in and end up a coherent version of ourselves in actual fact, we have to put our blinders on. We have to be very careful about the news that we're listening to, the signals we allow in, and also the people that we are letting in to our inner circle. That fragmentation yes, yes. can make such a, a schmozzle out of a beautiful trader, a beautiful investor. And another aspect that is one of the challenges that we're facing is that we think we are alone. We think that we are the only ones able to do this for ourselves and for our family. And it blocks us off. Mm -hmm. It isolates us. And it means that we don't look for solutions 
to people who've already found the answer to our problems. So I think we need to remember that there is some research that says isolation, if you do isolate yourself the way that we all are since the pandemic, we have all become much more yes. introverted. That is a proven fact with the scales that people are using to measure introversion and extroversion. If you isolate yourself, that is more harmful to your health than smoking a packet of cigarettes. Now, this is something that is not only for our investing future, this is our actual health. So that is, yeah. I think, something we need to be aware of. Write a card to a friend, put yourself out there, add a compliment in as a goal to give a compliment every day to somebody. Tell somebody who's helped you in the past I really appreciate you. Do something to get yourself out of yourself, out of your own little binocular tunnel vision mm. of your life so that you can invest and connect and be with people who care for you. Okay. Well, you've talked a lot about psychological resilience, Louise. Maybe you can share a personal experience where it's helped you in your investment journey to help our viewers and our listeners uh, understand what you're getting at. Yes. Michael, I am going to include a story that is very personal and that you played a part in. Now, the reason I wrote my new book, Investing Psychology Secrets, is back in 2019, I was with my daughter. We'd decided to go on a cruise and it was so much fun. She was 12 years old at the time, my little Ash, and yes. I knew that I wasn't well and I I lost my voice, but this was different. I lost it in a way that my entire throat felt like there was no connection. I had never had a situation where it was so open before. I'd had trouble with my voice for years, but there was never a feeling like this in my throat. No. And Ash had to get us home being 12 years old, explaining to taxi drivers, booking hotels, <laughs> trying to get us yeah. home. And I had, as you know, Michael, because you were so kind during this period, I had nine months where I could not even make a sound. There was no ability to get any sound, not even a hum, out of my voice box. It was unfortunate that one side of my throat had collapsed. And without that vibration with vocal folds, it means that you can't actually get any sound. So... It took me two years to be able to speak again. I still do speech therapy every day. I have had to be very diligent with my own health. And yes. at that stage, Michael, I have to say, I just was so grateful that I was already a full-time trader. If I had have had a real job or a standard role, I would have been yep. totally in a, in a box. It wouldn't have been able to be possible for me to work a normal role. Whereas trading the markets, investing in property with you, Michael, and also being able to research my own problem to find out what can I do to improve my mindset, but that can also have a byproduct of improving my trading results and my property results. So that was the culmination of mindset. I lived by the principle that the Ovid philosopher said, someday this pain will be useful to you. And during all that time, Michael, you stood beside me. You wrote me emails. You sent me videos. You checked on me. You made sure that I felt as good as I could under the circumstances. And you helped me to visualize a future where I may not be able to speak again. And I'm so grateful that you're in my life, my friend. My th thanks. I really appreciate that. Now, people are seeing you here, hearing you here, and you sound fantastic. But I know underneath all that still, you had to prepare. You weren't going to speak for a while before. You won't speak for a while afterwards. When we catch up socially, we've got to hide in a quiet corner somewhere. So, therefore, your resilience has got you through. In some cases, it would have been easy just to, to pack up and uh, give up. But I'm, I'm really, really glad and pleased you didn't. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, 
if we look at the world in general at the moment, most of us are connected 24-7 to a smartphone. I know I've got it next to my bed. I do the wrong things. I actually look at it before I even get out of bed in the morning. Um, I have it with me when I watch TV with Pam, and I sometimes sneak a little peek there. How do you see the impact of social media uh, affecting us as investors and on our psychology? Yes, social media. Look, the difficulty with social media is not only FOMO, which is fear of missing out. It's also where we rate ourselves in terms of our comparison. Now, there are two types of comparison. There's upward comparison and there's downward comparison. If you are looking to motivate yourself and you have good self-worth, you can always look to somebody just a bit further ahead of you and it can be motivating as heck. However, if your self-worth is compromised and you're looking at the people who have achieved more, maybe they're sending No, no, images. Louise, they haven't achieved more. They're pretending they've achieved more. They're showing off. You see the highlight reels. You don't see all the bits on the cutting room floor. So that's, I think, one of the things it's too easy to think, look what they've got and I haven't. Mm, it's true. It can be that way. But sometimes there are people genuinely who have oh, yes. gone down that road yes. further. So if you can develop your self-worth to the point where you can emulate them and you can yes. enjoy their success, you can cheerlead them, then that is a wonderful thing. And we do have to be careful about where we are at personally. And then, of course, there's downward comparison. So this can also take those two forms. One is positive where you're saying, what can I do to help people following me? And that is a beautiful thing. But the other is yeah. negative, and that is where we compare ourselves to people who are not where we are, and we go, well, you know, I'm so damn great, and mm. our ego gets totally out of whack. So I think with social media, this is what we're dealing with. We have to make sure that, firstly, we limit our ability to have this input because that can be noise. And secondly, that we are genuinely aware whether our upward and downward comparison is taking a positive or a negative concept when it comes to our personal evaluation. Interestingly, Louise, we've got a joint friend, Tom Corley, who studied the habits of the rich and the poor. And when he came to Australia, and I mentioned the tall poppy syndrome, where if some people are successful, there's always those on social media who try to knock them down. He didn't even know about that. There's no tall poppy syndrome in America. There, if somebody does well, they applaud them. They want to emulate them. They want to be like them. But unfortunately, here in Australia, that's not always the case, is it? So true. And it is unfortunate because we have to be careful that if we are ripping people down that have achieved more, then hung by the tongue, you are going to also stop yourself and cap yourself from achievement. So we do have to be careful that we are, especially for our children's sake and our grandchildren's sake, we have to be seen to encourage and to support and to elevate rather than to rip people down. Yeah. Okay, for those new to investing, they're probably thinking about this and saying, oh, they've been in it for a long time, for decades. I don't even know where to start to build the strong psychological foundation. These people who are now considered experts, I'm talking about you and me. But by the way, we started right from the beginning also, and boy, we had our share of ups and downs. But what advice would you give to somebody starting off? Allow it into your field of reference first. So by books, by audios, the fact that you are listening to this podcast and my podcast is Talking Trading. Now, Michael, I have to say that is one of the things that you definitely helped me with. My podcast has been, it's nearly 11 years now, and you wow. suggested I start that podcast way back then. So that is something that I'm so pleased. It's the greatest passion project of my life, actually, <laughs> talkingtrading.com.au. So I do think this is the first step where you start absorbing, you start listening to yourself. But the other thing that you can do, not only getting in information from the outside in, but also working out what's going on inside you. And the easiest way to do that is with a morning journal. So I suggest people get just a blank journal that they can write in, 
and aim to write for 20 minutes a day. Do that regularly, ideally every single day, and you'll be amazed. It's the cheapest therapy you'll ever get. It's something I've been doing since I was 21 years old. So I've got in the bookshelf behind me so many different journals that have really helped clarify my thoughts and brought out issues before they became a volcano. Much rather deal with it while it's manageable instead of when it escalates. So I think that is probably one of the easiest ways to get started with this. Now, some people are going to think, oh, that's rah-rah metaphysical stuff. But when you have been coaching in your mentoring program so many successful people, and I've run a mentorship program and deal with a whole lot of very successful investors, I've been doing that for close to two decades now, helping others, um, it's a common trait that successful people do, this journaling. People don't know how to start or where to start. It doesn't have to be formal. Just put down your thoughts it definitely does work but some of the people listening to this watching us today are going to say oh they were lucky it was easy for them um how important is luck when it comes to investing in your mind louise Yes. Luckily, there are studies about all of these situations that can trip us up. So it's a matter of ferreting out those results. I'll tell you about a study about luck because I find this to be fascinating. Richard Weissman, he conducted the study. It was about 20 years ago. Hey, he's got a great podcast also. Uh, yes. Even though it seems to be on pause at the moment, uh, but look out for Richard Weissman's podcast. Yes, very reputable. And he took a group of people that self-identified as either lucky or unlucky. And there were 400 people, so it's fairly large in terms of the study base size. And he said, what I want you to do is to go through this newspaper and count the number of photos that you see. Now, the lucky people, the people who self-identified as being lucky, they not only got the right answer 100% of the time, but they were also done in just a few seconds. Now, I'll tell you why in just a second, but have a think about what that could be. Why were the lucky people so fast and so accurate? Now, the unlucky group, they got a higher volatility with their results. Sometimes they were over the number, sometimes they were under, and it took them on average over two minutes. So seconds versus minutes, 100% accuracy versus volat volatility basically in the results. What do you think was the difference between those two groups? Now, if you are really saying to yourself that it is because the lucky people really are lucky, I will tell you what the difference was. On the second photo, they wrote in the study sample, they wrote, stop counting. There are 43 photos in this newspaper. You have finished. So wow. the lucky people were more observant. They took in detail. They had a broader perspective instead of just insanely counting photos because that's what they were told to do. They didn't suffer from target lock where you see the end result and you have to be focused in just on that result. That's how actually in the army they say that's how planes crash. So that broad perspective, that looking at all of the information, exposure to a variety of different inputs, we can use that as investors. Don't just isolate yourself talking to property investors if you're a property investor. Talk to a variety of different investors. Make sure you have that fast versus slow thinking as Daniel Kahneman the Nobel Prize winner who's just passed away talks about, have that slow thinking. You don't have to do everything immediately. You don't have to do it on gut feel. You can cast a broader net and get a better result. Now, Michael, I'm curious about your thoughts. Do you think that luck is a real thing? Yes, it is. I believe it is. And I think most successful people I've come across believe their success is related to luck, but they also believe that they've created their own luck and they've done it in a number of ways. They've pursued a dream, they've had a goal, they know where they want to go and so that they're the right person at the right circumstances when things happen. They forge habits around their dreams uh, and they know that if they do the right things and stop doing the wrong things, they're more likely to be successful. They build relationships with the right people, success-minded people, 
people who can also open doors for them. They keep learning things. They're voracious learners. And so therefore they've got the right information. They actually educate themselves, but they're also prepared to take risks. They find a mentor, like we've said before. So I think people put themselves in the situation of being lucky. They create their own luck. Now, occasionally dumb luck happens, uh, but I've actually never in my adult life bought a attached lotto ticket, but somebody recently lucked out and got, a, I don't know, what was it, $160 million from a lotto ticket. Um, that sort of luck's unlikely to happen to you. You're more likely to be struck by lightning. But why not put yourself in the position where you can become lucky and then be the right person to recognize it and then take action that's the other thing and i have found with my traders that come out of that, my mentor program into a bull market where they get that instant lift and money flows into their account they they it sounds like it would be ideal wouldn't it it does sound fantastic you get instant results the difficulty is if you track their performance over time they are actually the ones that quit because what happens is as soon as they get a downturn they weren't expecting that they weren't prepared for that and they tend to throw a bit of a hissy fit and a tantrum and they say no i don't want to do this anymore so that to me is a sign of where resilience can kick in know that this investing journey is not going to be smooth sailing there will be a time where you are going to be forced to have a day of reckoning are you going to continue? Is this something you want your future to reveal for you? Or is it something that you're just going to say, no, it's too hard, I must move on? So that as an extreme result, if we don't build our psychological fitness and if we don't take advantage of the resources available to us, then that is a threat. That is something that can happen. Well, interestingly, in the property field, we had a massive boom in 2021, 2020 and 21, when interest rates dropped after we felt more comfortable after COVID. And almost every property went up 20%, secondary properties, poor locations, regional markets. But it was also a time when there were a whole lot of new buyers agents out there and investors thinking they were so clever. I wrote a blog about this a while ago, and I'm sure I offended some people when I called them lucky idiots, because it really wasn't anything to do with their skills. It was more related to being at the right place at the right time and not even necessarily recognizing it. But I do agree that in principle, luck is important, but you've got to recognize what sort of luck it is, Louise. Mm, love it. Okay. Um, now, there's also, well, you and I spend a lot of time talking about the psychology of success, and we should actually spend a whole podcast talking about this. I'm almost scared to ask you the question because you could spend an hour sharing this, and it's really critical, but it's about our biases. We think we're rational human beings, but in fact, we're not, especially when it comes to money. So maybe we could have a quick overview on that. And then could we catch up another time and talk about the biases we must be aware of when it comes to investing? Oh, yes, you're right. This is a very extensive field. I'm going to bring it down to two or three, perhaps. So one of the biases that I think almost everybody can recognize is the arrival bias. It's called the arrival fallacy. So we think to ourselves, and I'll give you an exact example. When I had my first child, people said to me, when are you going to have a second child? Oh. <laughs> oh, come on. I've just had a baby. So I think a lot of people think that happiness is tied to an event in their future. Now, that is a difficult time because we like to think of ourselves in the future as having it all together, as knowing what we need to know and as being more resilient and more in control. But actually, if we are pin pinning all of our hopes on arriving at a particular point, I'll be happy when I buy my third property. I'll be happy when I ditch my spouse. I'll be happy when I get married. These are warning signs. There is no point in pinning all of your hopes on that one event because we have to claim happiness now. And I think that is something that we really do need to be aware of. If you're not happy now, then what are you going to do? What 
actions are you going to take to get you out of that layer of funk? That is something that you can affect your future with, but actually you can change today. And another bias, which I think is very prominent in the property field, is the endowment effect. Now, the endowment bias is where you think because you own it, it is just so good and it is really worth so much more than market value would dictate. I'm sure mm. you've seen that, Michael, if somebody owns their own house and they think, oh, I should be able to get four million for that and the market doesn't they want to give so them four. They put so much time, effort, emotion into it, Louise, that they don't think rationally. Mm. Mm. It is also us being aware of these situations so that we can combat that within ourselves. We can say to ourselves, am I in this state at the moment? Is this something that I'm not seeing the big picture? Because if we can do that, our end result and our objective will be achieved much more quickly. Mm. Definitely. So there's lots of biases. There's so many more. I think it's fascinating because, again, as I said, most of us don't think rationally when it comes to money or investing and it affects us. I, so even more so, I think, in your field of trading than in property. So let's have a session about that separately. Um, in trading, as we said a moment ago, the markets are a little bit more volatile. So some people suffer a loss. But interestingly, I had somebody leave a question and property update in the comments uh, section that they'd bought an off the plan property in what was probably a good suburb of Melbourne, but because they'd overpaid and bought it at the wrong time, they'd actually made a significant loss, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it still does happen if you buy the wrong property in, uh, in Australia. If people have suffered a big loss, how should they overcome it? Because mm. that would be putting you off, that would scare you. I'd think, well, I don't want to get on the horse again. I don't want to ride again. It's so true. And a lot of what we're talking about here is unprocessed feelings, things that we haven't really been able to add a structure around. So I really would suggest that people investigate the morning journal, but in a specific way. And I'll give you scientifically backed information on this. James Pennebaker did research on this and he looked at trauma he had university students involved and all of them had had some level of trauma in their life, varying degrees. He got them to write about it and the first part of the experiment was write as much as you can about this trauma and there were tears and gnashing of teeth because it is very difficult to overcome our own emotional fixation. We believe we're the result and that it can be something that will haunt us forever. So first of all, get all of your feelings out into that morning journal. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is the next day or the next week. A lot of people do this over a four day period. Then write about things that you didn't write about the first day, all of the feelings that you didn't cover yet so that every single thing is out of you. The third day or the third period, whenever you decide you can face it again, is to look at what did you do differently? What would you do differently if you had your time over again? So what are the lessons that you learned? What are the things that you wouldn't repeat? What are the things that you can derive as a result of that traumatic experience? Now, it's very difficult, for example, to do that if you think it's a freak occurrence However, there are still lessons. One of the lasses who did this experiment, she was crossing a street. Her best friend was crossing the street as well. They got hit by a car. Her best friend died. She managed to get through with six months in hospital and she couldn't find one thing she'd do differently until she was confronted with this again and again. And the thing she should have done differently is even though she was at the crossing, she really should have checked for cars. So there was a lesson even in a freak occurrence. And yeah. day, day four is looking into the future. What lessons are you willing to take with you? Is there anything out of that trauma that you want to bring with you? And if there isn't, what are you prepared to ditch? Now, this is a formulaic way of getting each day to have less negativity. 
So eventually mm-hmm. you are mm-hmm. working through that process. Yes. I take yes. you through it in my Investing Psychology Secrets book, but you're working through that process so that there's less and less of a hold that that negative aspect can have on your future life. Now you mentioned your Investing Psychology Secrets book. Where can people get it? Come and visit me at tradinggame.com.au, my website. I have got a limited number available currently because it is barely even on the market. So it is just Mm. getting to the point where it's going to be everywhere, splashed everywhere. But in the lead up, come and visit me, tradinggame.com.au. Make sure you grab a copy from the shop, but also Register your details because I can give you a free trading plan template and my trading made simple e-course. So they are the things that will help you not only do well in the share market, but also in the property market and any other investing that you would like to get involved with. And the other place you can find me is talkingtrading.com.au. Talking Trading, because we have Michael on as a guest as well. You are on our expert panel, Michael, and I've loved the interviews we've done with you. So either well, if you're I'll a podcast person. I'll leave links person, in the show notes. Yeah. I'll leave links in the show notes. And, of course, anyone who's a podcast person should go to wherever they're listening to this podcast. But people are probably watching this, listening to this, and saying, oh, she's so inspirational. She's so positive. Is it important to stay inspired and how can we do this considering all the challenges we keep experiencing? Yes, inspiration is so important. Find somebody that you relate with. It doesn't even have to be in your field. I draw a lot of inspiration through sports people. How do they handle particular situations? Mm. But also podcasts like this. So, Michael, I know that I'll be releasing this episode onto my podcast, Talking Trading, as well. So, Michael, could you perhaps give people a little bit more information about you? How can people find you and what will they find when they come and visit you? Well, a lot of people think I know a little bit about property. I know you and your husband <laughs> a little Chris, bit. Uh, know about this. I've Actually, let me boast for one sec. A couple of years ago, I was voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. And there were only two people in the property real estate area, Mark Burris and myself, and I'm not putting myself up with his level at, at, at all. But uh, my podcast, the Michael Yardney podcast, um, has had over 6 million downloads now. So if people are interested in podcasts, uh, they can uh, find it wherever they're listening to this. But my daily property update newsletter has a lot of information from a whole ring of experts, including you. There's your blog there on the psychology of success, Louise. And so if people want to create wealth, we actually don't sell property, uh, but we give in, uh, strategic property and wealth advice and help our clients outperform the markets safely by, by putting a plan together and then helping them implement that plan, Louise. Thanks, Michael. And you are one of my dearest friends. You have stood by me through thick and thin. We've known each other for such such a long time, there's no doubt. And the fact that professionally I've been able to utilise your services has meant a lot to me as well. So, Louise, thank you. I always enjoy our chats on a personal level and when I can get you onto my podcast. But I've actually to be blunt, only started reading Investment Psychology Secrets. While I've written nine books, I don't think I've ever read nine books in my adult life. I spend all day reading, all day studying, all day learning. But in fact, uh, you've given me a physical book to read. It's been a long time since I've done that rather than a Kindle. So I look forward to digging into that. And I look forward to um, just honing my skills. And I think from what I've read so far, It really is for people at all levels. Who did you aim at? Yes, it is. If you are already experienced as an investor, you will definitely pick up some gems. If you're a beginner, it will open up your entire world and you will see why psychological fitness is the key, Michael. Well, see, the thing is when people start investing in whatever it is, they think they need to do a million things. They need to know a million things. Usually there's only two or three or four in the field but there's something that they've got to get right before to be successful. We've kept saying that, but I'll say it one more time. It's your headspace, it's that uh, mindset that you've got. But clearly that's something you can change. That's one thing you have control over, Louise, because there's lots of things one doesn't have control over. 
It's so true. And one thing you do have control over for everybody listening is that you can refer a friend to this podcast. It is the best way for us to grow. Good people know good people. So refer a friend and we would also love a wonderful review on whatever platform you're listening to this on. Thank you for giving us the plug, Louise. Look forward to catching up with you again real soon. Thanks, Michael.